Hello, this is Nancy Heinz Glazer with another wonderful Meet the Artist program. And I'm so excited to have a visitor return who was here with me in 2003, maybe even earlier. Uh, and it's Maxine Giannini, a music teacher extraordinaire, composer, uh, well-known person, but you're here to talk about another wonderful passion. And I'm so happy you came back. Thank you, Maxine. Thank you. <laughs> We're here to talk about the amazing journey you've had in getting your husband's, your well-known artist husband's artwork published in a book and how you've persevered over 49 rejections, exactly. almost 12 years yes. to accomplish your goal. So when we first talked, you were all fresh about the idea of doing it. And here we are all these years later, and you've done it. It's coming out. It's almost a dream. I, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, and you know, I don't know why, but I've just appreciated you from the moment I met you because I knew you were going to get this done. That's it. No questions asked. Just when, right? <laughs> and tell us a little bit about the saga and, and a little bit about Hugo Giannini, your husband, and how all of this happened for you as, as the start of the journey in gathering his artwork for a mm -hmm. book? Well, I think the start of the journey began with the end of his journey. Uh, and uh, Ugo is an artist. And uh, in the hospital, uh, he was in Beth Israel Hospital for a month. Uh, and every morning that I walked into the hospital, he was landing on Omaha Beach every single morning for a month. And uh, he would say, you know, uh, get the hell out of that. He said, watch out, it's a trap. Uh, you've been shot. The other guy's been shot, you know. Um, and he landed on this speech every single morning. And then uh, the week before he died, he told me, don't go in the studio for six months because you'll be too upset. And I listened to that. He died in January and June. I opened the studio, and to my astonishment, there was a pastel, unfinished, on his easel. And it was H hour. Do we have? Yes, it was H hour. Pastel. Yeah, pull that into the screen for us, can you and please? H hour was a, a pastel, and H hour indicated. The hour of landing on D-Day, it was called H-hour D-Day. H-hour was 6 o'clock in the morning, 6.30 in the morning. And this is all symbolic of D-Day. This arrow is the bloody arrow of the 29th Division landing. These are the obstacles called tetrahedrons, which Rommel put up by the thousands on Omaha Beach to stop um, the boats from coming in. Oh, and this is what called, what's it called at the bottom? The, this dot is a door green sector, it indicates door green sector. Uh, and um, this whole work is a symbol of his landing. On, but he did that while he was on oxygen with no breath left at the very end of his life. So in his last breath, he was reliving the landing of H.R. And uh, that got me wondering about the impact of World War II on my husband. In addition, he made about 15 works, all using symbolism for the uh, invasion. And these were contemporary, enormous works hidden in his studio. So that was your first discovery, and he told you to go, but not for a while, and you waited in, you right. honored his wish, and you right. found this right. amazing work. Then his studio was just uh, loaded with hundreds of works, and I found um, a little folder, like an oak tag child's fo folder that you get from kindergarten, and in it, were 27 drawings that I didn't know existed. And that was of DJ and the landing. So uh, we have a few of them. 
over on the exhibit Here. table. Yeah, and I think we have some throughout. This I is, uh, yeah, this is, this is the morning of June 6, 1944. Um, this is unknown to the rest of the world that there was an artist, if you saw Saving Private Ryan, in the dark green sector of the 29th Division on Omaha Beach, in the midst of all of this, who climbed into uh, a, a hull, a crater made by a bombardment of the naval, um, because on the June 6th, we were supposed to have a bombardment of the beach and to leave craters and safety places for the 29th coming in. And the bombs uh, went a few thousand yards uh, further in, and they missed the beach entirely. So there was no place for these men to find any safety at all. It was a flat beach, and they were just being slaughtered in uh, what they called enfilade. They were in crossfire. If you moved one place or another, somebody got you. So. Here was this man, an MP from the 29th Division, 116th Regiment, who climbed into a crater made by naval bombardment and started to draw. He said he saw the whole invasion coming toward him. And as an artist, he decided that's how he would maintain himself and record what he saw. And there were artists hired by the government but they did not put anyone on uh, Omaha Beach because they were told that if they put three men on Omaha Beach, they would be three men short in their art department. Nobody was going to survive. They didn't expect survival. So they had, the only recording was a very short time when Robert Kappa came on and uh, he was on the beach for about four hours and got sick and nauseous. They had to take him off. And he made uh, some photographs, which are known all over the world. Uh, and those photographs were uh, exposed to light. They were so eager to see the works that as they developed them, someone exposed them, said so they're in very poor shape. But Ugo's work is here, and it's not known. It's not known. Some of the self-portraits, uh, what I'm most right. amazed by is the steadiness of the drawing and the self-portraits which are reflective and haunting, but there's also action in some of the other right. work. Right. So it's both that opportunity, if you're lucky, to have a moment to pause and think, and then the action that you're faced with. It's just really the duality for me. Yeah. which speaks so loudly. Well, this is a, a, a portrait of one of his buddies. This is the 29th. Uh, it, uh, it's their uh, symbol. Of, it's called the yin and yang symbol, and it played a part in all of Ugo's work afterward. Uh, and in the abstract works, it's always there, the yin and yang symbol. And it was the blue and gray um, division, the 29th division, yin and yang. It's always the yin and yang sign. And, and you see in the face, these men were kids. You know, they were 18 to mid-20s. Ugo was the old man of his group, he was 25. But after 44 days of constant um, battle from June 6th, to the fall of St. Lo, these men were in continual action. They never took off their uniform, they never changed their socks, they never had a shower. They became old men. And these old men uh, were shattered by what they had seen and what they had experienced and what war had done to them. They were called unblooded troops. And I thought that's a terrible, sophisticated way of looking at an army by Omar Bradley and Eisenhower because they knew statistically when they, they sent these men in, they expected a 50% loss, 50% loss. 
And uh, in the 29th Division, out of 14,000 some odd men in the entire division, by uh, July, it had been cut in half. They lost half of a division. And he was there recording this, and I think as witness to the rest of us, and to be our witness, and, and artists often do that. They create yes. the, the oh. historic document, even sometimes by accident, because they must, this is what they must do. And his gifts truly are, are immeasurable to me, and just the experience of seeing the work makes it so vivid and I believe in photography and movies but there's something about yeah, uh, it's in, a drawing. In, right, in, in the line you feel the, the world. This is in Germany, in Alsdorf, Germany and it's rounding up prisoners and it, you look at the faces of the prisoners and you look at the background, the, the destruction uh, of the cities. The cities were absolutely destroyed. And when you found the work, you knew you had to do this. You knew that you had to stick this out, get a book done somehow, take the memoirs, put it together. And you began that 12 years ago, 13 years ago? I went to uh, Omaha Beach for the, fifth, uh, for the 50th anniversary. And what year was that? Then help me with that. Hmm? What year was that? <laughs> the 15th, 90, uh, 94. Hugo okay. died in 93. Okay. We went to Paris in 92, and he wanted to go to the beaches. And um, he got pneumonia. We went in on a Friday. On Saturday night, he got terribly ill. On Sunday, I took him to the hospital, the American hospital. And we had rented a car. We had everything set up to go back. It was very important for him to go back to the beaches. And um, when you, I got to the hospital, they said he has pneumonia, but he has fibrosis. And that was the, the first the discovery. time we got the Now, you his. wanted to read a passage, I think, of the book. Could you do that for me now as we go out for a break? Would you read just a moment uh, yeah, that I'd, you had in mind? I'd love to. Well, this is the, the beginning of the book, and I call it The Haunting. Um, perhaps uh, one would expect to really know and understand one's mate of 37 years. What secrets, what silences could there be after all that time? What hidden events, buried emotions, forbidden topics could be explored? What conversations were lost in the petty pursuit of daily life, the children, the house, the job, the friends, our families? the rush of the holidays, the struggle to survive. How is it possible not to know and comprehend what happened to you and to the men of the 29th Division? The chasm that uh, existed between a war veteran and a civilian was enormous. The difference in age, you were 25 and in the war, and I, 15, a teenager in high school, gave us completely different perspectives. Then there was the silence, the unspoken. You were not alone in your silence. It was as if there never had been a World War II, never a D-Day, never the loss of division after division, never a Holocaust, just that sweet, boring, mundane, conventional 50s, 60s, 70s, and 93, the year of your death. The world was eager to forget the upheaval and madness of World War II of Hitler, Mussolini, Emperor Hirohito, the bomb, Dresden, Auschwitz. We averted our eyes, and the veterans knew that they couldn't reveal what they had seen, a reality so horrific that it had to be eradicated from one's consciousness, like a nightmare one tries to erase in the early morning light. You used to say to me that I was naive. I didn't know what the life was really like. Here in the States, we were all living a dream. And there in Europe, you knew the nightmare. And that's why you came back. I knew you were here. It was the evening of your funeral, February 3rd, 93. I was sitting alone about 2 a.m. in the living room 
and I sensed your presence. I know it sounds a little nuts, but you were here and you made me understand that I had to tell your story, to write the book that you intended to write and to be sure that the story which is yours would be told. Thank you, Maxine. We're going to go out for a break and talk some more when we come back. Okay. It's pretty moving and powerful. And we're going to just talk about the excitement of you getting the story out there. Stay tuned. Don't turn that dial. Come on back and listen to more with Maxine Giannini about her husband's work. You go, Giannini. Famous, world famous. Once you're hit by a train, this is the size of bag that we'll use to collect what's left of you on the tracks. It was a horrible tragedy that, that could have been averted if we had just stayed off the tracks. I don't want to have to be the one that has to go tell your parents that you're dead. Make the right choice. Stay off the tracks. And welcome back, Nancy Heinz Glaser with Maxine Giannini and the story of getting the story published of your husband's work and his document of D-Day, Normandy. And I think you have a sample copy of the book that, uh, at least the cover of our book that's coming out, our book, I consider it our book. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And this is, is the new title, Drawing D-Day, An Artist's Journey Through War, by Ugo Giannini with Maxine Giannini. So it's really Ugo's book, his letters, his drawings. His memoirs. And what you were telling me originally, I think, during the break and before, is that for years, nobody really knew whether it was a memoir book or whether it was an art book, and it was finding just the right fit of somebody who got it, who understood that it was both because it was a total story. Right. Right? They right. just wanted to compartmentalize it. Who is your publisher that's putting this well, out Well, I went you? to a self-publisher named Vantage Press, and the president's name is David Lamb, and I brought the material that I had gathered, and I said, David, I don't have money to publish this book. He said, don't worry about it. We're doing it. So they're backing, they're backing us, and um, they have, um, it'll be published in the States, Canada, England, and Australia. So I'm just thrilled. And they have, I have an editor, an art director, and um, a publicity campaign. So it's like magic. It is, and in November of 2012. Well, they is said the December date? they'll release. December, it'll be okay. Finished in November. And so we can see you. We'll see you on the book signing tour. I'm I hope sure, so. right? Yeah, you know, I'll be there taking your picture, <laughs> whether you want it or not. But I think really the determination you have had to get this published is the story for all of us. Forty-nine rejections, twelve to thirteen years at least. And you ha it's a story that had to be told. There was no way it wouldn't be. Right. But you had to have that gumption. I, you, you, give me a quick story, because you told me you walked by the book. You did it one time, and you kept walking by it. And you picked you it know, back up and redid I, it, right? Uh, after 49 rejections, I got slightly discouraged. <laughs> so I, I severed my uh, relationship. I didn't realize what a formidable man this, this guy was. but. Uh, his name was Simon Lipscar, and he really believed in the book, and he really fought for it. But the, the trade would have no part of it. So I, I put the book in a uh, box in my bedroom, and I kept on passing by, and it was like a thorn, because um, I knew I had to rewrite it, and I couldn't stand to look at it. So this year, in October, I decided what is essential in this book that's different from this, what makes this book totally different from any book on World War II. And I said, it's the uniqueness of Hugo's drawings and his letters, which are formidable. So I went through every chapter. I put it, you know, I had it on a CD and I went through every chapter, redid it, reprinted it, and took it to a publisher that week and that week I got a contract well it 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 
it gelled, it brewed, the wine was ready right. for this to come out. And, um, you know, I think that a lot of people in my age group, I had a dad who was in the war, who never talked about it, came home, wouldn't talk about it. It was always about what was next. I had an uncle who flew, I don't know, 314 missions over Germany and <laughs> Japan and Korea, never wanted to talk about it. You know, lots of oak clusters and... Um, and that was so hidden for so many. So it's such a painful thing that they almost couldn't speak of it. And, exactly. Right? And yeah. and little by little, some of our oldsters are talking some about it. Some of these it. stories are coming out at the, really, 70 years later. It'll be the, is it the 70th anniversary of DJ. Um, 2014. I can't even believe I'm alive in 2000. I didn't expect to live that long. And here you are, informative yourself, to be honest. So um, yeah. I am just in deep gratitude to your husband and his work and documenting it for us so we'll never forget. Never. We must never forget because even now people are wanting to uh, dismiss it. Uh, services, the Holocaust services remind us each year that each year that passes fewer people remain to be the witness. Exactly. And uh, that there's almost a an arrogant disregard for the fact that it even occurred. And we just can't let it happen. I won't let it happen myself. But certainly you and your husband are a testament to the fact that it happened and it was in your life but I I know your family's been totally invested in this and watching you go through this and um, what was it that just it was just that the story must be told or did you get up every day and say oh geez I just can't and just but I got to did you do a struggle with yourself yeah yeah you know it was the ultimate procrastination uh, I just uh, I didn't want to do it I, you know I never saw myself as a writer and um, and then I was convinced I wasn't based on all of those projections. But somebody believed in you. Yes. yes. So your publicist believed in you, right? For Regardless. Sure. And yes. uh, now his work has also traveled the, the world, the original works. Uh, and well, the first the first exhibition I had was through the State Department in Paris for the 50th anniversary, and then through headquarters. Uh, in in Germany, Hamburg, Germany, I made arrangements to show the G. Clays um, for the 50th anniversary, and I've been back many times since and had many exhibitions. I had an exhibition for the opening of Overlord, which is also the first monument to um, uh, the 29th Division and Omaha Beach. Was called the whole operation with was called Overlord, and then D Day. And then I know that uh, you had an opportunity to be in Washington. I think that was in two thousand and eight. And Ernest Borgnine at the time was was um, honoring the big Memorial Day, if I recall. And uh, so there's a real effort to constantly make sure we don't forget. I met you uh, and then went to an event and I saw the woman who was made famous by the cover of Life magazine, oh, right. and, uh, Edith Shane, who right. was the nurse who was kissed by the sailor. And, um, and so you've made it real for me. And, you know, and it's my father-in-law, it's my dad and their memory and their honor and my uncle. And mm -hmm. I want to give a quick shout out to a friend's dad who's 92 and still going to college. And his name is Harold Denzis, and he's a veteran of both World War II and Korea. Wow. And so they don't call it the greatest generation for nothing. Uh, but it, mostly I'm just, um, I get excited when I see the work because it's truly a demonstration of his talent. He was director of art at Caldwell College, or if I understand, for quite a few he, years as well when he came professor, back. professor, right. Professor. For many, many years. And I think what's fascinating is that the uniform the stance, the uniform of the Germans. This is um, Santlo four kilometers. This is these are drawings in real time. They're not memories. Right. They were done on the spot as it happened, and they capture the whole essence of those moments. And he dates them. So this is July forty-four, uh, France. Santlo sector, right? July forty-four, France. 
Right. And the 29th Division uh, was in combat on front line for 244 days. And they were replaced 14,000 men by 20,111 men. You know, so, so it was. General Gerhardt was said to have one, uh, one regiment in the hospital, one regiment killed, and one regiment on the battlefield, but actually he destroyed much more than that. We have one minute left. I want you to give uh, our viewers something that they can take away from your experience in a minute. Can you do that? That's a lot to ask for something that's taken 12 years and 49 rejections. Do you have a thought personally that came to you as you did this and you were done with it when you got it ready and they said we're going to publish it? What did you feel like? Well, I feel enormously grateful uh, to these men who gave everything that they had to to do a job is what they said. Um, what they really did was to save uh, humanity. So I'm enormously grateful that I was I could represent Ugo in some way and represent the story in a very evocative way. And we have women also, and waves and wax, and we had women who were there, and um, by the numbers, far smaller. Uh, but all of the people who just really made a difference to give us the life we currently have and our freedom of speech being protected and um, the ability to have a TV show to talk about right. the stories. Right. There is so much to be thankful for and I want to thank you speaking of that thank you and I want to say thanks to you go to and thank you for joining us Nancy Heinz Glazer with me the artist